coming up on the program. U.S. Special Envoy for Haiti resigns over the deportation of Haitian migrants. An apology with no apology as the U.S. and France make up somewhat over telephone following the spat over the AUKUS deal. Plus, flood wreaks havoc in the Spanish city of Huelva as the royal family meets La Palma volcano evacuees. Hello and welcome to the program. I'm Teniola Shoboale. We begin with the deportation of Haiti migrants at the U.S. southern border. A touchy situation for many Americans, but perhaps even more personal for Haiti's special envoy to the United States who resigned today in protest. Daniel Foote says the decision to return migrants feeling an earthquake and political instability was inhumane. In his resignation letter, he described Haiti as a collapsed state that simply cannot support the forced infusion of thousands of returned migrants lacking food, shelter and money without additional avoidable human tragedy. Last weekend, the U.S. started deportation flights from a Texas border town where about 13,000 migrants had gathered under a bridge. Local officials have struggled to provide them with food and adequate sanitation. Meanwhile, amid the worsened conditions in migrant camps on both sides of the U.S.-Mexico border, uh, U.S. authorities tried to deal with the situation on Wednesday, releasing some migrants in South Texas uh, while deporting others on flights. At the Valverde Border Humanitarian Coalition Migrant Center in Del Rio, Texas, resources are stretched as volunteers and staff help the released migrants, including many pregnant women, book flights and bus tickets to join family members. In the past three days, the center has processed over a thousand migrants. In Kostrat, it processed 3,649 migrants uh, the entire month of August. Many of the families are headed to Houston where they will have one night of shelter uh, lodging before catching their transportation. When they arrive, they'll be given a meal and they have an opportunity to stay overnight. They have uh, uh, accommodations, shelter accommodations uh, for one night and all families are using the, the international airports, the train and the bus to continue on with their journey to their final destination. There is no funding that's given out at our location. There is no funding that's given out at the migrant family transport location. And in most cases, families have been preparing for this moment. They have their funding ready. And when they don't, they contact their loved ones here in America who help them pay for their final tickets. And in Mexico, hundreds of migrants are queuing outside the Mexican Commission for Refugee Assistance in Mexico City in order to remain in Mexico. While most migrants are looking to reach the U.S. after learning about the situation in the northern border, some are preferred to get work in Mexico. In Monterrey, an industrial city in northern Mexico, migrants gather outside a shelter to receive food. In order to accommodate everyone, the shelter's management has placed tents outside so that migrants who are waiting to seek refuge in Mexico can stay protected from the rain and the sun. Most of them here have not arrived directly from Haiti. Many had previously tried to settle in South America but recount difficulties finding work amid pandemic related restrictions and the economic downturn. Now, while Australia says it will be patient in rebuilding ties with France, France are rebuffed to attempt to arrange a conversation between Prime Minister Scott Morrison and President Emmanuel Macron. On the other hand, U.S. President Joe Biden had a lot of luck. He and President Macron had a phone conversation lasting 30 minutes on Wednesday. White House Press Secretary Jen Psaki uh, says the convoy was friendly. In a joint statement issued after, 
the two leaders agreed to launch in-depth consultations to rebuild trust and to meet in Europe at the end of October and committed to supporting counter-terrorism operations in the Sahel conducted by European states, though it's unclear if this might mean the deployment of U.S. special forces or merely greater logistical support. Uh, it was, uh, uh, Our correspondent, uh, we're Maria hopeful. Bird, is, is, is in Washington step. for us to discuss more on this. Maria, it's good to see you. Uh, so let's talk about the situation at the southern border. Officials are working to send as many uh, of those under the bridge back home home uh, to their home countries. Incidentally, most are Haitians, but we're also hearing that thousands more could be on their way uh, to the United States as we speak. Yes, you're exactly correct. Um, and I noted earlier in the piece, it stated that, you know, the U.S. has been getting quite a bit of criticism for the treatment of those uh, Haitian refugees at the border trying to come into the U.S. and actually being sent back home where we know not only has natural disaster hit, but political disaster has hit, and there's a political crisis in Haiti at the time. And so, uh, you know, that was definitely something that many Americans um, obviously have spoken out against um, and have really called the administration on whether or not that was the appropriate move and whether or not we were treating the Haitian refugees in the same way we have other refugees that have come from Central America. And so, that has become a major concern. As you stated, there's still some Haitian refugees that are being deported back home, um, but there are others that are being brought into the U.S. There has been quite a bit of a ground swelling of support for Haitians, um, and there are many Americans, and specifically Haitian Americans, that have gone down to the border uh, areas, and they are actually raising funding to be able to help provide support uh, for those Haitian refugees. You know, this is a fine line, Maria, observing those immigration policies and having to be humane. At the same time, the president and uh, the administration has been criticized a lot, especially in recent days, as pictures of the situation uh, emerge. But this is not a problem caused by the administration, but as a result of the political and economic instability going on in Haiti. I know I asked this yesterday, but what is President Biden's plan to execute policy while being humane? Well, President Biden has had to pay close attention to the asylum policy that currently exists in the U.S. We have a policy that is designated for individuals taking asylum in our country, whether it's political asylum, whether it's natural disaster asylum, whatever the issue is that they are facing, there are certain policies to address that. And most of the Asian refugees, if not all of them, meet the criteria for asylum in the U.S. That is a policy that many Americans have been calling it like close attention to and to ensure uh, they are following that appropriately. And speak to those pictures that have come out that obviously uh, created global response and global anger uh, regarding the treatment of Asian refugees um, at the border. Um, the administration has definitely denounced this type of behavior, but the real question that many are asking is what are they going to do to ensure that behavior does never occurs again, and what policies and what practices were in place to even have that type of behavior occurring at the border. Okay, Maria, let's just uh, move away from the immigration crisis now. It's being described as an apology without an apology. Uh, that's the phone call between President Biden and the French president over the AUKUS deal. And that's because there was no apology on the side of the U.S. for the deal itself. What do you think uh, the leaders will be discussing when they meet in a few weeks? And how do you see the conversation progressing? You're exactly correct. Uh, there was a, a some, somewhat of a um, unspoken apology uh, that occurred. Now, for the first time in a long time, you see the president of the U.S. and uh, his administration acknowledging some areas of misstep uh, from the U.S. As it, re as it relates to not including France or communicating with one of their strongest allies um, since the beginning of the Iraq war. And so, um, we know that that was something that he did acknowledge on the call. This is about a third phone call. And he also acknowledged and asked to have a meeting 
um, when he enters Rome in just a few weeks from now uh, to meet with those individuals um, in, in Rome. And so I think that they will probably be having a private meeting to discuss this further, to discuss the future relationship between France and the U.S. Um, but it was very clear uh, that the U.S. president did acknowledge uh, missteps on their behalf and, and that um, there was a joint statement that came out shortly after the phone call uh, to try to show the diplomacy and the fact that there is a mending of relationship moving forward. All right then, Maria, we appreciate the reporting. Thanks for joining us. Thank you for having me. So the COVID-19 pandemic now, head of the Africa Centers for Disease Control and Prevention, Dr. John Inkengasong, says the UK's policy of not accepting COVID-19 vaccine certificates from Africa could increase vaccine hesitancy. He was addressing a virtual briefing that the UK stance was confusing and had far-reaching implications for vaccination campaigns, as some Africans would ask why they should take these vaccines if they were not recognized internationally. Here's more on the situation around the world in our COVID-19 global update. The meeting of the General Assembly is called... South African President Cyril Ramaphosa has called the unequal distribution of vaccines across the world an indictment on humanity. He made the comments during his speech at the UN General Assembly. It is an indictment on humanity that more than 82% of the world's vaccine doses have been acquired by wealthy countries while less than 1% has gone to low-income countries. Unless we address this as a matter of urgency, the pandemic will last much longer and new mutations of the virus will emerge and spread. South Africa reaffirms its call for fair and equitable distribution of vaccines. We urge all member states to support the proposal for a temporary waiver of certain provisions of the agreement on trade-related aspects of intellectual property rights to allow more countries, particularly low- and middle-income countries, to produce COVID-19 vaccines. In other developments, the United States Food and Drug Administration has authorized a booster dose of BioNTech-Pfizer coronavirus vaccine for several at-risk groups, including Americans 65 years of age and older, those at risk of severe disease, and people who are regularly exposed to the virus. Japan is set to double its vaccine donation quota to nearly 60 million doses. This comes in addition to the 30 million doses and 1 billion the country has pledged to the COVAX program run by the Gavi Vaccine Alliance and the World Health Organization. Elsewhere in Asia, authorities in South Korea have warned vacationers to get tested upon return, even in cases with mild COVID-19 type symptoms. The country has been grappling with a fourth wave of the virus since early July, but some allowances were made for gatherings during the Shisek holiday week. Russia has reported 820 coronavirus-related deaths in the last 24 hours, matching an all-time high set on August 26. The country also recorded 3,445 new infections in the last 24 hours, the most reported in a single day since July 31st. The Kremlin says officials are not discussing the idea of reimposing lockdown measures or other restrictions, but that the government and regional officials are monitoring the situation closely. <laughs> and finally, New Zealand's largest city, Auckland, has moved to level three lockdown restrictions, allowing cafes and restaurants to reopen for takeaway services and construction workers to return to building sites. New Zealand eliminated COVID-19 last year and had been largely virus-free, barring a small number of cases in February, until an outbreak of the Delta variant erupted in August, prompting Prime Minister Jacinda Ardern to order a nationwide lockdown. So to come on the program. Well, it's probably the best feeling in the world, being up above the world so high. That's the story of Natalie Maniglia. Please stay with us.
Thank you for staying with us still on health matters. The World Health Organization is appealing to donors in the international community to continue funding the UN body campaign in Afghanistan as the country faces imminent humanitarian catastrophe. The appeal is coming from the WHO Director General Tedros Ghebreyesus in Geneva after having visited Afghanistan and its region with Lebanon, Omar and Qatar. He says cases of infant disease polio, which was close to be eradicated in the country could make a reappearance in the country. Over the past 20 years, significant health gains have been made in Afghanistan in reducing maternal and child mortality, moving toward this polio eradication and more. Those gains are now at severe risk with the country's health system on the brink of collapse. There has been a surge in cases of measles and diarrhea. Almost 50% of children are at high, at risk of malnutrition. The resurgence of polio is a major risk, and 2.1 million doses of COVID-19 vaccine remain unused. And our police in the UK say a British teacher found murdered in a London park had been on a five-minute walk from her home to meet a friend in a pub. 28-year-old Sabina Nessa left her home in South London just before 8.30 p.m. on September the 17th, making her way through Cater Park towards the depot bar on Pegler Square in Kidbrook Village. She never arrived and her body was found in the park by a member of the public the next afternoon. Uh, Police believe Nessa was approached by someone in the park and fatally attacked. A man was arrested as part of police lines of investigation, but he was released as investigation continues. I'm appealing for information into the tragic death of Sabina Nessa. Sabina, we believe, was walking from her home address and would have left just before 8.30 p.m. We now understand that Sabina was planning on meeting a friend at the depot pub at Peckler Square, which is just over five minutes walk away. Her journey would have seen her walk through Cater Park, and we believe as she walked through the park, she was approached by an individual and fatally attacked. Sabina's body was sadly found by a member of the public around 5.30 p.m. the following day. You will see that we have an extensive crime scene in place and we expect it to be here for the next couple of days. We also have a, a number of high visibility patrols and would encourage anyone who has concerns to engage with those officers. They are here to listen to what you have to say. The officers that you see here are your officers. They are part of the community and wish to stand with the community at this time. Now, what to do when you need to make a case for maternity leave? Well, you bring your baby to work. That's literally what British opposition lawmaker Stella Creasy did today when uh, they raised a question about maternity leave for parliamentarians, holding her newborn to her chest in the House of Commons. She demanded from the leader of the House a meeting of lawmakers from all parties to ensure the law on maternity leave was upheld. Leader of the House of Commons, Jacob Rees Morgan, replied by congratulating her on the behaviour of the baby who remained quiet during the proceedings. Indeed, the Independent Parliamentary Standards Authority refused to fund appropriate maternity cover for myself on the basis that people needed to be able to speak in the chamber. Yet today, in order to speak, I have had to abandon my baby proxy leave vote or else be reprimanded by the House authorities for speaking in the chambers, making Parliament one of the few workplaces in this country where when a new mother comes in to do a keep in touch day, she is rebuked, not supported. I know some in this place are not fans of mothers in, mother, in the mother of all Parliament, but I'm sure the Leader of the House is not among them. So will he meet with a cross-party delegation of MPs to look at how we can make sure that everybody in this Parliament upholds the law on maternity cover and leave? Um, uh, and our German Chancellor hopeful Armin Laschet, the Premier of Germany's most 
populist state and North Rhine Westphalia presents himself as, himself as the Angela Merkel continuity candidate. Last year's hopes his own credentials as a third and trusted manager with centrist views will more than compensate for his lack of personal charisma and catapult him into Germany's top job. However, opinion polls show him lagging behind his main rival, the Social Democrats candidate and current Vice Chancellor Olaf Scholz. Earlier this month, the Merkel in Parliament made an impassioned plea to German voters to back her would-be successor last yet at the September 26 national election, as an opinion poll showed support for the Conservative slumping to an all-time low. Now, Spain's Welva city has been inundated by floods. Video published online show cars getting swept away by water as heavy flooding hit the town of Almendragelo in the region of Estremadura. Neighboring towns have also been hit by floodwaters following torrential storms. The region's president says he has activated level one of flood risk emergency plan. Meanwhile, Spain's royals have arrived in La Palma to meet volcano evacuees as eruption continues for a fifth day. King Felipe and Queen Letizia, along with Prime Minister Pedro Sanchez and Interior Minister Fernando Grande Malasca, visited some of the thousands of evacuees at El Forte Barracks. About 6,000 of La Palma's population of 80,000 have been evacuated since Sunday. Some were allowed back briefly to recover belongings. For a fifth day, lava flowing down the slopes of the volcano engulfed more than 200 houses, schools and banana plantations, although more slowly than in previous days. Experts who had originally predicted the lava would hit the Atlantic Ocean late on Monday, potentially causing explosions and sending out clouds of toxic gases. And as we close the program, here's a story to lift your spirits. Natalie Maniglia is one lucky woman who has had her wish come true. She's always wanted to experience flying in formation with a flock of geese. Many sound, may sound ordinary for you, but not for Natalie, who has a, a degenerative eye condition and is gradually losing her sight. She has nursed the ambition to do this before it's all gone. She achieved her ambition on Wednesday when pilot Dominic Cruciani took her up in his micro light over the French Alps, accompanied by a flock of juvenile geese trained to flow the aircraft through the skies. Back on the ground, she was so moved by the experience, she embraced the family member who came with her and sobbed onto her shoulder. When she could finally speak, she described their experience as magical. Really touching. And that's the program today. Thank you so much for watching. I'm Tenyo Lashibo Ale. Bye for now.